Today's event at this time also is a wonderful thing uh, because Professor Ashmore is one of the few people, uh, young and good, uh, active scholars who actually uh, got uh, ed graduate education in Beijing too. So not because usually we have a lot of Chinese people coming to America to get an advanced degree, and Professor Ashmore is one of the few people who get an advanced degree from Beida, Beida, and then come back and get another degree from Harvard before he goes to Berkeley and teach. He is uh, special in uh, his research because he does a 9th century literature, but more than just doing literature, he also does poetry, and then also he's also a very musical person, so he does music and literature in many ways. And he's in, among us, among friends, we really, know as a very creative and in, interesting fellow who has all kinds of funny ideas that we always want to do. Oh, I wish I had thought about that first before he does it. But he's the one who always gets to think about those things first. So uh, without further ado, I will welcome Professor Ashmore to give us a fantastic lecture. And also I have to tell you that he is doing uh, you have a great favor because Originally, we scheduled this lecture to be given by a Chinese scholar affiliated with the Tianjin people. So, uh, let me make it another. I do not know what happened with American embassies. They did not give that Chinese scholar the visa. So, I quickly asked Robert to come as a backup. And we've been really short time and he generously and heroically accepted this challenge to come all over the his take time from his busy schedule and give us his fantastic title the hydro room is absolutely appropriate and exciting. So well. Um, thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks to Joseph uh, for the invitation invitation and to the Confucius Institute um, as well and thanks to all of you for, for coming out. Um, uh, Joseph, as he just described, he'd mentioned to me that there was this very exciting performance coming up on the, on the weekend, tomorrow evening, um, and mentioned that it might be interesting or good to try to do something in the presentation today that might dovetail in, in a way, in an indirect way with that performance. Um, my work is primarily in earlier materials, but I am very interested in issues relating to interpretation and performance, including both commentarial traditions and, and music, um, including genres like poetry that may or may not be musical in a narrow sense. Um, and it, as it happens, I'm in the beginning stages of working on a collaborative project to do a, a workbook, a source book of some fairly extensive translations from some of the major uh, commentaries to vernacular theater and drama that's being organized by Steve West and Wilt Edema. Um, and I volunteered to do the section on, the, on Jin Sheng Tan's uh, Shui Hu Zhuan commentary really because I'm, I'm interested in commentary and also a f I'm a, just a fan of the text. Um, so I'm going to try to adapt my preliminary thoughts on this project to the, um, the context of this occasion today, and I'll try at the end to get into s talking about Jin Sheng Tan's treatment of some of the scenes in the Shui Hu Zhuan that will make an appearance in tomorrow evening's performances. Um, now, <clears throat> speaking of Jin Sheng Tan's Shui Hu Zhuan commentary, his first chapter he calls not the first chapter, he calls it the wedge, the xiezi. Uh, this is an innovation he apparently came up with. I mean, what Jin Shen Tan means by xiezi, he derives the term from theatrical performance traditions, but what he means by it is it is something that's not directly related to the main topic at hand, but that can serve as a way of indirectly bringing in what you really want to talk about and perhaps opening out, creating a space within which we can either tell a story or in, in this case examine some questions. So what I would like to do today is to present a xiezi, and the xiezi is in the form of a film clip. Um, this, I need to uh, bring this up. And what I want to look at in this, in this short clip, just about a, a couple of minutes, is, um, is this question of, oh, now we're not, we have no sound. Let me see if I can get the sound. Otherwise, we may have to lose the sheds. Um, well, what I'll do is, I, I guess the sound was just working. It's not working now. Um, I, will, I will just talk over the clip um, rather than abandoning it. This is, I hope you recognize the movie. 
This is actually a kind of a production extra from the, uh, one of the DVD versions of uh, a Stephen Chow movie called Kung Fu Hustle. Um, and th uh, this is a kind of behind the scenes analysis of some of the fight scenes in that movie. And what I wanted to talk about here is, is, is in a sense, this is the kind of the, the, the commentarial uh, production here. That this, is the, this is the fight choreographer who's discussing, and I think if you want to read along with the subtitles, pretend that there's Cantonese going on and read the subtitles, this is a clip from the movie. Again, I hope most of you know the movie. It would have been in a way nice to watch the clip. I, this, the nighttime fighting scene with the zithers is classic. I hope you can summon the memory of that scene. Um, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I've, I've just saved your weekend. You can go watch it. You need to go watch this movie this weekend. And this is the fight choreographer talking about all of the kinds of thinking and planning that went into making the scene. What I particularly like about, and this is Stephen Chow, of course, discussing his uh, ex background, his, the, the, pr the process through which he came up to be, to be doing this movie and his thoughts about the process. Um, what I particularly like as well is the way they're relating this rather zany, wild, it's a comic martial arts film, um, the way in which they're relating this to broader tradition of Hong Kong history, Hong Kong martial arts culture, of the craft of filmmaking, very technical aspects, the, so the problem solving dimension of how, for example, this, I think he's talking about this right now, how when the zither assassins who are these very frightening figures we've seen, this is the practice, here's one of them in the back uh, sitting there and this is the, so here's the, there's the, the zither assassin getting in place, the, how they a can, are actually able to attack in a very powerful way by strumming the zither and sending these waves of energy um, that are as powerful or not, if not more powerful than, than bladed weapons. So I, I, this is a kind of a fun behind the scenes little clip and I'll go ahead, without the sound I think we lose a little bit of the, of, of the, the, the point of doing it. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But what I wanna, I wanna use this wedge, I wanna use this wedge as a way to think about how we, what we see happening around a kind of performance that I, I, on the one hand involves a very arresting, very gripping spectacle. I mean, the Shui Hu Drawing, which we're going to get around to, is a lot of it really is building up to moments of tension, moments of violence, moments of very virtuosic and entertaining fighting. Um, and what happens when we take this kind of spectacle and we start to have a more of a layered we develop around the spectacle. We don't lose the spectacle, but we create a kind of a layered appreciation of this. It's, we, it could be a matter of promoting, in the case of, of our appreciation of a film like Kung Fu Hustle, just called Gong Fu in Chinese. Um, it might be a matter of somehow thinking of this not just as a fun flick to watch for entertainment, but to think about in terms of a history and as something that has a, has a kind of stature as an artwork. So it might, be, it might be along the lines of this sort of a promotion, thinking of something that might not have, been, that might not have seemed so serious before in a more serious way. Or it might just be a matter of thinking about this in terms of the complexity of interrelations and the planning and the, and the, the pragmatic side, the, the persons involved in creating and generating and the kind of, so what's called in Chinese ku xin, the bitter heart, the bitter mind, that is the, the, the effort of the craftsman to put something together so that you can enjoy the spectacle. That when that also becomes part of our appreciation of the, of the spectacle, it's an interesting kind of family of issues that we might be able to talk about that I think may, may be useful to have in mind. Again, it's kind of a space for us to think about as we turn to look at the world of late imperial uh, fiction and drama um, commentaries. Um, so uh, I want to then look, so we have here this first, my first image, this is from a Ming painting, it's a Ming version of the, of the Qiming Shanghe Tu, where we have this little scene, it's a fight scene. This is really, we see how, you know, everyone loves a fight, right? There's a fight, there's a crowd. We can't really tell for sure whether this is just a spontaneous fight of people who are having a conflict, or whether this is a kind of performance. And I think in a sense it almost, it, it's, it's very interesting that we don't know. And in a sense it doesn't matter, the spectacle is a spectacle. Um, and, and what I also think is nice to point out, we see here, this is illustrations from uh, Shui Hu Zhuan texts, um, where we see it, it may be a little, this is um, the death of Xi Menqing. This is Wu Song, one of the heroes who doesn't appear in the drum, perf drum song performances tomorrow, um, but of course a major hero. And if you can make this out, this is Wu Song, ha having just killed Xi Menqing, the big villain, uh, libertine Shi Menqing. And, and so that's Wu Song. 
That's part of Ximanqing. And that's the rest of Ximanqing up there. And then Wu Song, of course, as we all know, he's getting ready to jump down into the street. And this is the big fight between Wu Song and, uh, and the Jiang Menshen. This, this a big kind of yeah, heroic type. One of, again, two of the very epic uh, fight scenes in the Shui Hu Zhuan. And what I want to point out, just sort of opportunistically here, is when we look at these two pictures, that is the, the, uh, the Qingming Shanghe Tu, this is just a picture of, of urban life, and we see these illustrations of Shui Hu Zhuan. What we realize is the, the Shui Hu Zhuan, I think, in some ways more than the other big uh, classic vernacular novels is really of a world that's, that's interpermeable with the world of the readers of the novel. And we can even say maybe those guys in the Ming fight scene, if they have mental images in mind of what they're doing or if they're using language, it's very likely actually drawn from the Shui Hu Zhuan in some way, directly or indirectly. Um, so this, this is a very interesting kind of text to look at in terms of the process of, again, this is something that over this period is becoming a classic that becomes canonized and revered in the way that earlier only the, the sort of standard classical literary classics or the, or the canonical Confucian classics would have been, would have been treated. So um, now what, what I want to do before we look at uh, Jin Sheng Tan in particular is to, there's a, there's a very nice image here and what I want to use this for is, is to, to think about, to step back and think about the question, why is it that once this commentarial genre, that is that the, we're using these kinds of commentary that would or ordinarily in earlier periods have been used for more highbrow things, whether it be again literary classics or actual canonical scriptural classics, we use these commentarial, some of these, it's not that they're the same thing, but we apply, start applying some of these these techniques and these commentarial approaches to vernacular fiction and drama. When we think of commentary to vernacular fiction and drama, we may be thinking in terms of, of explaining the meaning to us so we get the meaning of the old text. But that's not really the, what these commentaries are really about. And it's very interesting to note that these, once they emerge, and Jin Sheng Tan is really a, a key figure in the rise of this as, a, as a, both a genre and as a publishing fad. Um, throughout the subsequent history of pre-modern, of, of imperial China, this becomes, that is having a commentary. When you're, if you're a publisher and you're producing a text of a classical drama, dramatic or, or fictional work, having a commentary, especially a commentary by a prestigious, charismatic, renowned, scholarly type person is a very big selling point. Um, and so what I want to do to kind of get into this is to look at um, you know, the question, you know, why, why is the commentary such a good thing? And, and this page actually gives us, I think, some very nice things, um, to clues towards answering the question. Now this is a page from a text of the Xixiangji, the story of the Western Wing which is of course a, is a, a dramatic classic from the Yuan Dynasty that is massively popular in the Ming Dynasty, not only on the stage, but also as a reading text. And this particular edition is um, in, the com in, the, in the edition that's with commentary by Li Zhuo Wu, uh, or, or Li Zhi, whose dates are 1527 to 1602 for your, for your reference. Um, so some of you may know Li Zhuo Wu is, is a very charismatic, iconoclastic, eccentric, uh, he's a scholar of traditional philosophy in a, in, in a very a strange brand, but yet nonetheless a brand of what we would call, sometimes call neo-Confucian philosophical, ethical thought. And he's also a very iconoclastic sort of cultural, theatrical figure. And his commentaries, he's one of the first people who become extremely popular and, and in, in demand for commentaries of this type. Now this page in particular has a lot of features that are, were so enticing that I couldn't resist starting a talk on the Shui Hu Zhuan by looking at Xixiangji. This, in this section, I've, I'm sure a lot of you know the story of the Xixiangji. It's the romance between uh, student Zhang and the lovely woman Cui Yingying, whom student Zhang meets when he's visiting a mon Buddhist monastery. Cui Yingying and her mother and her maidservant Hong Yang, or Crimson, are, are lodging in the monastery. And this passage is from early in the play, right after Zhang Sheng, student Zhang, has first seen uh, Ying Ying. And um, so I'll, I'll read some of the poetry here. This is, a, this is starting, his singing is here, and then these, this section here is the, uh, the spoken parts that link the song parts. The large characters here are the, are the sung parts. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read part of this. He's, he's thinking about what's just happened. So what happened is that she, he saw her, he was entranced, and she was then quickly led away out of view. But as she was being led away, she turned back and she looked at him. 
once, and he was finished. Okay, it, was the, it was the turning back and looking. This is the, this is the, this is the point, it, one of the classic favorite moments in the drama. So I'll, I'll just read, you know, this is Steve West's translation, Steve West and Vilt Edema's translation of, of this. Uh, I'm just going to start from, from this, this part here. Um, that is, so my, my, um, my hungry eyes have gazed until they are shot through. My starving mouth has salivated until I swallow in vain. In vain I am affected with a marrow-piercing love longing. How can I withstand her who turned her autumn ripples on me as she left? Um, this is, the, this is the, um, the, the, turning, the turning back of the... This is the... That's the moment that, is, that's, that really gets him. Now what we see in the commentator edition, where we're read, we're, what we're doing is we're doing what readers of this text would do. And when we read in this commentated edition, what are the other layers of, of experience that are available for us on the page? First of all, we see here this blank spot at the top of the page, the blank area at the top of the page is what we call the, the eyebrow or the mate. And so these comments are called bay or, or eyebrow, eyebrow comments. These black ones are the, are, these are the comments of Li Zhuo Wu. Um, and so here his comment is, yi shen su ran qi lai. He says, uh, from head to toe, melting and tingly. He's becoming melting and tingly. That is student Zhang. Now, when we read the comment, what we understand is that Li Zhuo Wei, in commenting and um, reflecting on this moment about the turning of the autumn ripples, is that he's, how do you understand that Zhang Sheng feels this way? You understand it by feeling that way a little bit yourself, right? So Li Zhuo Wu also feels, is feeling a little tingly. Now, what else do we see here? There's another layer. The red, both this red inked comment and we see all of this, the circles. This is actually the handwritten marks by a, an, a, an owner of this book. And what this owner is doing is going and now reading not just the Xi Jiangji, but Xi Jiangji with Li Zhuo commentary, not just this, and, and now he's responding, and he's responding not just to the text of the drama, but as you see, he's also, so the Chen here, the, the circles, in this case, he's using these in the idiom in which that means hao. It means that's really good stuff, okay? So he's, he's putting circles next to the stuff that's good stuff. And now, the, what he, look at what he's done up here. He also puts the trend next to Li Zhuo's comment. So he thinks that's also really good. So he's entering into this kind of a dialogue. Li Zhuo was sort of reading along with him, and he's, he's having this dialogue. And notice here, this is a little bit hard to make out on the image. This is his own ha handwritten comment where he's, Zhang Sheng at this point is complaining about how uh, the walls of the monastery now block him off from seeing Cui Ying Ying again. Um, and he says, they're as high as heaven. And then this commenter says, this is uh, um, He says, even heaven he would be able to climb over. He's a real rascal. Now this is actually, this is, I think Li Zhuo would actually really have appreciated this comment. Those of you who know the play well will understand why. Because what happens later in the play, the, one of the emblematic moments in the play, Zhang Sheng in fact climbs over one of the walls in the monastery to get to so this is a very elegant comment. He said, because just at the moment in the aria where Zhang Sheng is complaining about how he's blocked by these walls that are as high as the sky, the commentator is saying, oh, you know, look at this guy. He's a, he's a, he's a devil. And then we see Li Zhuo comment here. It just says, Chun se man yuan guan bu zhu. Or guan, I can't see, is it guan bu? Yeah, guan bu zhu. Um, this, the shoes of spring fill the garden and cannot be contained, or not to be contained. And this is, so we see the two, two, these two comments are on the same wavelength. Well, they're saying, okay, we, we appreciate this moment, but what Zhang Zheng's complaining about is the process that's starting in his, in this, his, his love affair with, with Ying Ying is, is gonna be something that will overcome all of the obstacles that he's complaining about. Um, so there are a lot of, this, this, the sense of the layered experience of the page is one that I think is a really nice uh, reminder of some of the attractions of this mode of reading and why, again, why it was so popular. Again, people looking for the commentated editions in late Ming and in Qing China were, for the most part, not looking for someone to explain what the words mean. They're looking for someone who's a really good, the kind of person you want to have sitting next to you and kind of reading along with you. Okay? Now, there's one further thing I'll just mention in passing, is that um, we, we see this, these are the comments by Li Zhuo Wu. This, and you see how the, 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 we would call it a font, the, 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 the writing is in a different style, a markedly different style from the very blocky style of the actual text of the play. Um, and so if we look at this again, if we're looking at this image, 
uh, we would probably, we might well assume that this is actually handwritten commentary. In fact, this is, the, the, the handwritten is in fact facsimile. That is, it's, it's meticulously carved wood block. The, the technique is exactly the same as these, as these characters here. It's just that it's been very meticulously carved imitation of a handwritten comment. So I think this is a, a point that's really worth reflecting on. Why is this? Because I think there's an answer. Now, why would you want to have, why is it important to have even the, it's not just a transcription of Lee Drobel's comments, but you have the facsimile. You have something that is a simulacrum of the actual copy that he might have owned and scribbled in um, himself. And again, I think the key to this, again, we're thinking that someone is spending the amount of time and effort that it takes and the craftsmanship to do this indicates that there's, there's a strong motivation, including commercial motivation. So the fact that this is such an appealing thing to be able to, to sell in your, in your text is a suggestion that you know, we really like, what we want is that sense of a personal connection with this charismatic early reader. Uh, yes? Is this in movable type? No, this is all wood block. This is all carved block. Yeah, and so not, not movable. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so now I, I am going to move on to, um, to move to Jin Cheng Tan. Um, but I'm going to take one small detour. To get into the world of Jin Cheng Tan's thinking about writing and the meaning of writing and also the commentarial genre that he practices, I think that I'm not going to argue that this, is the, that this is the only source for his ideas, but I will argue that if we understand a little bit about this very strange literary genre called the examination essay, that is, this, it has all of these names here. Um, this is the Bagu one is the one that has the, is the most, uh, it's the most negative one. It has the most negative connotations. Everyone knows if you say Bhagawan, you know it's bad. But what I want to suggest is let's, you know, I'll, I'll just say for the sake of argument, I'll say I think it's bad too. Um, but in this period, it's, a, it's, it's almost a hegemonic form. That is an educational system in the way that people learn to write, in the way that people think about writing. Um, learning how to produce this particular strange kind of form is actually of decisive importance and therefore whether we like it or not I think it's it's actually kind of interesting just to get a sense of what it looks like and how it works and what are the issues that come out of of the literature both of writing of of examination essays and the commentating of examination essays because again I'll argue these are these are relevant to what Jin Cheng Tan does in his own practice um, okay so I want to start by, I'm, going to, I'm just going to do a, a, a quick kind of narrative of what the essay is. And in the process of doing this, we're going to end up covering some of this. I'm, I'm putting the names of these texts, these two, we have two bodies of classic texts. This is what we, we conventionally now say, Su Shu Wu Jing. In terms of historical precedence, of course, it's the Wu Jing are the early and medieval canonical texts. The Su Shu are an innovation in the Song Dynasty, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I'm going to focus on the Bagu essay or the examination essay itself. Okay, so first of all, what is the format? The format is derived from an old but evil practice of what's called Tiejing or the masked classic. And what that meant was if you're a student and you're going to be tested on a classic text, then you'll go in and to be examined, your examiner will cover up all but a few characters on a, on a page of the classic. So you get to look at those few, few characters, any three to five or so, something like very small number of characters, and then you're going to be tested on your recall of the context from which it came and maybe what's, what's the significance. That's the, that's the kind of, it's, a, it's essentially a kind of a memory test and a, 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 an ability to recall context. Um, now, what happens between the Tiejing and the, and the examination essay as practiced in the Ming and Qing dynasty is this whole transformation of the culture of scholarship around the classics that we associate with the Song dynasty, what we sometimes call the Li Xue, the study of the study of principle, or Dao Xue, study of the way, also in English sometimes referred to as Neo-Confucianism. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the, the educational perspective. Again, education and exams always go together. So rather than try to give us a, a survey of all of this very complicated cultural and intellectual history, I'm just going to focus on the exam issue. What's the problem with the old kind of exam in the view of the people doing the reform? It's that it's basically rote memory. It's alienated learning. It's a learning where you, you learn this and that, the thing you learn is over there, you learn it and you're still you and it's still it. And that's a problem because what you want to really test is not just whether someone knows the classics, but whether, since the classics are the legacy, the textual legacy of sages from the pre-dynastic past, of these un unparalleled, unmatchable sages who have unparalleled, unmatchable insight into everything about the world, 
the idea of studying the classics is to reconstitute that moral stature. It's not just to learn a text. So, so what's the way out? I mean, what's the way out that's proposed uh, that leads up to the examination essay, again, as practiced in the Ming and Qing dynasty? This has to do with taking out the, the four books are isolated. You know, two of the four books, as, as I'm sure many of you know, are excerpts from the five classics themselves. Two others are texts associated with prominent masters of of pre-imperial uh, transmission of the classics, that is, Mencius and Confucius. And these four books are taken out not to supplant the five classics, but, th but to say, well, empirically, when a, when a, when a young person is learning, is, is being educated, learning to read the classics, the problem with trying to read the five classics right away is that you, it's, it will f it's too easy to have it fall into a kind of alienated learning. It's learning, just, it's learning without a real embodiment, full, full understanding of making the language really your own. And that the four books are a pathway. You start with the four books and you have a way in. And once you have a way in, then the process starts. And then you can go on. The idea is you can continue incrementally, uh, organically. You can continue um, through to the five classics. And again, this is one more important point. That's a, it's, it's a refinement of the system that comes out of the Song Dynasty orthodoxy as, as embodied in the institution of the, of the examination essay, is that this process of reading is in fact contiguous with the process of understanding everything. Okay? And this, that process is what we call, um, my pointer here, um, this is what we call goal, right? The idea of goal, this is often translated investigation of things. The problem with investigation of things is that Go has to do with, it's, I, I almost like something like alignment. It's lining things up. You, go, you, get, you, have, you gain deep insight into the inner workings of people, of relationships, of social institutions, of, of history, of natural world, of, of literally anything. If you, once you have this process, this organic process going that you can, the, in principle, you can be a master of any kind of, a, of the dynamic process that's in the world around you. Um, and the idea is that the, better, the, the, the further you go, the better you get at it. And at a certain point, you go, so go means you investigate things or you align things. But in classical Chinese, you can say, wu ge, right? Things align. At a certain point, it becomes spontaneous. Okay, that's the, and that's the sort of ideal state that we're aspiring to. Now, what does this have to do with examination essay? The examination essay it's modeled on the Tianjin in the sense that you get a short excerpt from a classic text, usually four books. In principle, examination essays can be set on any topic, but you're getting the topic is going to be a short excerpt from a classic text. And then what the student does is not just explain this means this and that means that, but to elucidate the meaning of that text in its context, which you also still have to remember, but in a way such that the utterance itself is not just a talking about of that, but it's a revealing of a self. That the examination is revealing the self. It's a performance of a kind of spontaneous ability to express things in a way that, that has a sound that makes it manifestly obvious whether or not the person has really embodied the classics. Now, this is the, this is the logic of the institution. We, we all know, of course, it never works. Nothing ever works like that. But this is the logic, this is the underlying logic of the institution that I think we need to, we need to kind of keep in mind. Again, even, even keeping in mind the fact that we all think Babu is bad. Okay. Um, so, um, now I actually want to do something, if we can do this quickly, do something a little crazy, is actually look at one of these, these scary monsters. Um, this, is, there's an, this is an examination essay on on this passage from the Analects. Okay, and I'll, I'll let you read the translation. In the interest of time, I'll let you all read the translation because I know you can read much more quickly than I can speak. But the examination is focusing on the first exchange. Zigong, one of the Confucius's most uh, commonly occurring disciples in the, in the text of the Analects, um, he says, if someone broadly spreads benefits among the common folk and is able to succor the masses, how would that be? Could we call such a person humane? That's the question. Can we call Ren? Can we call this person humane or Ren? And Confucius says, in such a case, what need would there be for the word humane that would surely be a sage? Okay, so this is, this, is the, this is the topic. And now what we have here, this is, and I want to give you again the visual. What this is is not a student's copy of an examination. This is a publication from uh, 1594 of a 1541 
Metropolitan Examination Essay. And this is actually the essay that's produced by the examining official as the model essay. This is what, this is called Chengwen. Um, and as we see, it's also annotated. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail, but I want to, I want to just talk just a, enough about the, the structure of the beginning of the essay itself so that we can make a little bit sense of sense of some of these commenta the commentarial notes. Um, and I apologize, some of these are, are probably very hard to make out, if not impossible, with this, on this screen. Um, so let's look at the beginning. What do you do in the beginning is you do something called the po ti. You take the ti, which is the citation from the classic, and the, to po ti means you open it up. That is, you, you say some preliminary things that indicate the direction your essay is going to take. And in this case, he says, the sage points out that what the worthy is asking about is not only sufficient to be called humane, but it's also even enough to be likened to sage, sagehood. So he's, in this case, the poetry is really almost just paraphrase of the, of the tea. This is somewhat unusual, but this is an interesting kind of poetry. And then you develop, you expand the idea a little bit. Now the key moment here, especially for our interest in fiction commentaries, is um, we, we talk about this, the, the reasoning behind this, that there's, there is surely a good reason why the sage says this because um, if that's the standard for humaneness, then no one in this world is humane. Okay. Um, and so this is, here's the passage. Um, uh, he, this is in the past, and this, so this is, now we start, we get into a dramatic, this is really like a dramatic scenario. Okay. In the past, Zigong asked about, again, broadly spreading benefits and, and suckering the masses and whether that could be humane. And our master, Wu Fuzi, now this is calling, Wu Fu, this is calling Confucius Wu Fuzi from the perspective of the person writing the essay. Our master, the master of our school. Okay. Wu Fuzi, Xiao Zhi, Ruo Yue. Our master instructed him, and here's actually a very tr deceptively key moment. It's as though he were saying, now what comes after this, it's as though he were saying, from this Tian Xia Zhi and all the people of the world, from this onward, this is what we call entering into the voice of the sage or worthy. We call Ru Ko Qi. The Ko Qi in this in, in, um, examination essay criticism refers to the usually very highly, it's a laudatory term, meaning that this, the examination succeeds in conveying a real sense of living, breathing, speaking presence of that real person who actually generated the text, that you fully You've, understand it, you've understood so much as to be a practically an embodiment of that sage or worthy. Um, and so, but this is the moment formally where it happens. You, you speak the main part of the essay, and I've left out, there's one more page about this length that I've left out just to fit on one slide. Um, but I wanna, I wanna talk about just one moment here, and again, I have the essay, but I, I, in the interest of time, I, wanna, I don't wanna go through it in any detail. But there's one move that happens here that, um, He's, he, where where the, 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 the writer of the examination, they say, says, he, we have basically a, a question about the relation between sagehood and humaneness. Um, humaneness is kind of a general quality. We think of it as a quality that we see in actions and thoughts and sometimes in persons. And a sage is, of course, the ultimate attainment of, of moral stature that humans are capable of. And again, sage is something that is very, very high even though in later tradition we routinely, routinely refer to Confucius as a sage, Confucius himself never will never make the claim himself. So this is where he's talking about something that's very lofty. So what's the relation between these two terms? Now there's a move that happens in the, in the, in the exposition, in the essay here, that talks about, there are different ways of talking about Ren. You can talk about it from one instance or one, one beginning or instance, Yi Duan, or you can talk about it in terms of its full embodiment. So and this is the opposition. Now we get into this, the parallel structures and the, and the interrelated clauses. This is where the essay really is able to expand in a, in a way that's at least, it has a kind of structural drive and direction. Um, and so this is the moment that's being selected for, for laudatory comment here. And I, I, need, I, I can't make it out the text myself from here, so I need to go to my, I have a translation here. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, this is, this is the, the comment here, is that the essay writer, um, he picks out this one term, duan, or instance, or beginning, and his whole attention the whole time is focused on the one word, sage, right? So that what's elegant about this move is that he's, he's bringing in a term that doesn't appear in the text, 
And the, the calculation of bringing the term in is with an eye towards, he's setting up, he's establishing, he's making space for the thing he really wants to get to. Because the idea is, the idea in the structure is if he, if he comes out and says Sheng right away, it's, it's, it's not going to be as compelling. It's not going to seem as natural. It's going to seem more labored. Um, now, I'll, and I'll continue this comment. So he, is, is that he, here he, he doesn't meticulously follow the ko qi. He doesn't meticulously follow the tone of the, uh, of the topic itself. And this is why you can't pin down the, the, the language of the answer in a definite way. And he says, this is what you have to be able to do in order to be, you could maybe make this up. This is only like, only when you can do this can you be a guo shou. Can you be a national level master? And of course, this examination essay is in fact being written by a very high level Hanlin official at the court. Um, now this last, this last second comment is, to, is just a kind of, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's about the essay, about the essay writer. He says, um, he says, it's a live dragon or a live tiger. You just can't pin it down. It's a very interesting language to be using about an essay, much less an essay like this. That we, I mean, I'm sure many of you would rather, there are lots of things you'd rather do than read a lot of this kind of essay. But there's this language about, the, about dynamism, about power, about force, something that can't be contained, can't be, can't be pinned down. That's part of the, the, the critical language. Now what we have in the end here, this, this sort of ping at the end of the piece is what we call zong ping, or concluding summary, summary evaluation. Um, is, it says that um, in, in the first half, completely unarmed with his bare hands, he displays heaven-splitting feats of prowess. His explication of the word sage is utterly methodical with every word carefully pondered and arranged. So he's praising on, for, for, for two kinds of things. He's saying that the organization is impeccable, but it's not just an organization that you could draw an outline of. It's an organization that's, that has this kind of power. And again, I, I honestly, when I, I was looking through a volume of examination essays to, to find something to work with as an image for this presentation, and I honestly wasn't looking for martial arts sounding stuff. I really, I promise. But this, what does it mean to say that he's in the first half, he's he has, he's completely unarmed and barehanded. He, he makes this display. This kind of language is intrinsically metaphorical and it's not designed to be all that pin, you know, subject to being pinned down. But I do think here what we can, what we can relate this to is that the opening is actually somewhat, maybe deliberately flat. That is, his, the poetry doesn't really create momentum. He, the poetry, sometimes poetry, the opening of the topic can give you a kind of a contrast or a pair of terms that really have a kind of dynamic relation such that once you do the poetry, then you basically, the examination essay can kind of flow naturally from that. So he's saying this is, he's just doing it with his bare hands. He has a poetry where he's basically just kind of restating the topic itself and then starting basically from nothing. He does this, he makes this structure. He uses the word, the, this, the word duan and he creates this structure where there's all of this kind of energy and, and elegance and also clarity. Okay, so this is a very different kind of world. It's a different world in many ways from the text of the Xi Xiang Ji. But as we see in Jin Sheng Tan, there's the, the, the kind of thinking about what the, in, our assumptions about the basic significance and meaning of writing, the basic qualities of good writing. And what I like here in particular is, as well is this, that here we actually have a comment about Kou Qi. Kou Qi is usually a positive thing. It means you have the, the tone of the master. But what we have here is a positive comment that's saying it's because he's not meticulously following the Kou Qi. So I think what we, what's at stake here is something like the difference between pretending to be someone and just being someone. Like if, if you're pretending to be someone, then you have to really think about, okay, I've got to try to act like that person acts. But if you're fully, if you just are the person, you just, you don't have to hold to any kind of fixed rule. You just be the person that you are. Um, so now I want to at last turn to Jin Sheng Tan and, and make, make some concluding comments to sort of tie this together with some issues that we might be able to see in terms of the sorts of comments that Jin Sheng Tan brings to, brings to bear in the world of the heroes and the, in the, the kind of craft that even when we, whether we read this in the novel form or when we hear it unfolding in real time, the drama of actual spoken sound, I think that these may turn out to be not so alien kinds of performance media or, or um, entertainment or reading uh, appreciation media as we might see at first think. Um, now one of the key ways to make this connection, to bring this back to Jin Sheng Tan, is a very interesting preface that Jin Sheng Tan writes to his Shui Hu Zhuan commentary um, in which he describes his own education. And one thing at the very beginning is very striking and very unusual and a little bit eccentric. 
He says, he, he describes he was in elementary school, as what would correspond to elementary school, and what were they learning? Learning the four books. And he says, at the time, I, I, I didn't really know, I didn't know what it was about. Um, which is, remember, the four books are supposed to be the, the easy way into reading the classics and starting this process of guowu. So what happens is then, one year when he's 11 years old, or 11 sui old, he's sick and he's not able to go to school and he starts reading a series, a series of kind of more various non, non-canonical in the sense of Confucian canon texts. Um, and the last one he reads in this se- sequence is the Shui Hu Zhuan. It's the one that he really becomes immersed in. And, but the story that he tells, so there's a kind of, what he's telling is a kind of a trajectory of education where there's a divergence. He doesn't go in towards this process of learning about the world or learning about the classics or becoming a complete person, becoming a master of writing. He doesn't go through the regular gateway, but what happens is af- at, when he learns the Shui Hu Zhuan, he, he, he absorbs it, he makes the commentary at the age of 11, which is pretty impressive. He starts his commentary where he really tries to elucidate all of the things that he's discovering. He just starts having discoveries. He has discovery after discovery after discovery. Um, and as a result, he then comes back later in the preface. He's become, he's had insight from the Shui Hu Zhuan that now allows him to do what? Well, among other things, it allows him to appreciate, for example, the fine writing compositional skill of the Analects. Okay? So he, it's not that he's, re, he's not saying, oh, I, I'm doing a different path. I'm saying I'm doing, it's, it's all really, it's all the same. Now, what is the one thing that he, he praises the, the Shui Hu Zhuan most effusively for? Um, it's the way in which the author, he calls the author Shunayan. I mean, whether or not Shunayan really exists is another question that maybe we could leave to some discussion after, after the, the presentation. Um, he calls the author Shunayan, and, and the, 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 the idea of an author Shunayan is actually very central to Jin Shengtan's commentarial pro- project because he says, well, what Shunayan is doing is he's taking a core of 36 people who actually have some historical record about them. He's adding 72 more to, the, to make this vast repertoire of characters, and every single one of them is unmistakable. You can, every single one is unmistakably that one. The way they speak, the way they move, the way they fight, the way they think, the way they respond to different kinds of situations, the way they are loyal or disloyal, everything is completely, their, their parallels and their, their contrasts, but there's never anything that's predictable. Um, and how does he claim? Again, he, he creates Jin Shengtan as an, uh, sorry, I get them mixed up because it's very easy to get Jin Shengtan and Shunayan mixed up when you're reading Jin Shengtan's commentary. Because the, this is the author, this Shunayan, the author of Shui Hu Zhuan, is exactly the author that Jin Shengtan needs to be the one he can praise as being the genius who's able to think of all of this, all of these literary kinds of uh, expressions. It's because it's not, he's not bound down by history. It's really all about this um, miraculous structure of writing. So that episodes are unfolding um, as a way of demonstrating, of creating a kind of energy. Um, we also notice that the, his heroes often take on qualities of both the author and the commentator. For example, Lu Zhishen is this, he's unpredictable, he's a force of nature, he's unrestrained, uh, he's, he, you never know what he's going to do. Uh, you think you know him, and then he'll do something a little bit different, which turns out to make him even more like himself. Um, this, this sort of thing, I mean, this is something that I've, I've kind of been coming across lately that I, I think is interesting to perhaps think about further, is that the, the major heroes, that is the ones that, that Jin Shengtan likes the most, that is Lu Zhishen and Wu Song in particular, um, in the commentary also seem to kind of take on the status of authors within the text. That is, their own actions, their own thoughts are conceived of as being particularly brilliant. And I'll j- just give one quick example at the end. Um, that is, uh, I think there was an image on the poster for this event where we have uh, Lu Zhishen, although at the moment when he's in, in the picture, he's, he's still just Lu Da. He's not Lu Zhishen yet, he's not a monk. He's, he's killing, this is his first, the murder that causes him to have to flee into the world of the Jianghu, of the bandits, is when he kills this uh, butcher who is called Zheng the Butcher also who calls himself uh, um, uh, Zheng Guanxi, the sort of the master, master of the West of the Passes. Um, and in, in this fight scene, Jin Shengtan's, there's really a kind of fight choreography, which is both pointing out narrative touches like Jin Shengtan's when, when Lu Zhishen goes to Zheng Guanxi's butcher shop to kill him. Um, just as he's arriving, Jin uh, Shunayan sticks in, uh, a little comment that there's, this, there's the innkeeper who's coming to warn 
uh, butcher Zheng about Lu Zhishen and about this other situation that there's not time to get into. Um, and so he's standing, he, but he sees Lu Zhishen is already there and he, st he stands there at a distance. So Shunayan or Jin Sheng Tan's Shunayan is placing this figure in the periphery, just as he's getting to the main kind of dish. He's getting to the main topic. He puts this little figure who's peripheral, who's there watching, he's afraid to go closer. And it creates, again, a sense of the kind of, this is the spectacle of a fight that's starting to take shape. We have several more spectators come by over the course of the fight. Another thing that he praises Lu Zhishan for is, is there's a kind of, Lu Zhishan finds himself in kind of a compositional impasse. He's, he's sworn, or he's, he has the intention of at least beating up, if not killing, the butcher, clearly. I um, mean, yet when he, he gets there, there's no, and this is Jin Sheng Tan's commentary, he says there's, there's, there's no way to get a fight going. There's no way to get a fight going, so what does Lu Zhishan do? Well, he starts making up commands from his commander to the butcher. He says, okay, I need 10 pounds of all lean pork, and there better not be any fat in the pork, and I want it to be chopped really fine. And the butcher says, he sends the order, he says, no, 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 you do it. Okay. And so Jin Sheng Tan is telling us, okay, what is he doing? He's, he's, he's coming up with just, a wonderful, this is all Miao Wen. This is all wondrous writing that's both Shunayan's writing and also Lu Zhishan's writing. Um, he's, and he's both, he's, he's building up the situation so that he can get his, get his energy up to the level where he can actually start, you know, moving against the, the butcher. And he's also delaying and allowing time for this, the, the father and daughter whom he's rescued from the bad butcher and the, whose, whose predicament caused him to come kill the butcher, he's also delaying for them. So they're off, they're off camera and they're get, making their getaway while Lu Zhishan does all the delaying tactics. So this kind of, this kind of stagecraft or fight choreography is something that, that Jin Sheng Tan is very tuned into and aware of. And he, he gives, so the next order is for all fatty, fatty pork, 10 pounds of all fatty pork, no lean at all, and I want it chopped really fine, and I want you to do it. And then the third one, he says, I want all gristle, and I want 10 pounds of all gristle, and there better not be any meat, any, any lean meat or any fatty meat, and I want you to chop it up all fine, and I, you know, and I want you to do it. And at that point, the butcher says, you know, are, are you messing with me? Jin Sheng Tan, then, is a wonderful comment, says, in effect, this is all Lu Zhishan needs. That, that, that utterance by the butcher, that's all, that was all Jin Sheng Tan needed, and he goes to work. Okay? And then this is, this, we have the style of fighting, which is a lot of you, I'm sure, oops, that was my reminder to myself that the time is getting about up. So this is pretty good. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, time's about up for, Zheng, for Butcher Zheng too, unfortunately. Um, Lu Zhishan, when he, whenever he, when Lu Zhishan hits someone, they stay hit. Okay? And so when he, there's, no, there's no particular style, it's just zhi yi zhang, zhi yi jiao, just one fist, one palm, one foot, and the effects are fairly horrific. And so in, the, in dispatching but Butcher, Butcher Zheng, he hits, him, uh, he hits him first in the nose. And there's this very weird passage in the, in the novel text that describes this kind, of, this kind of fantastic mixture. It's as though all of these sauce bottles have been smashed and there's all of these smells that are coming. And this is a strange moment. Jin Sheng Tan says, this is, he equates this with the Buddhist uh, sensory field of smell. Um, this is a straight, and he does the same, the next punch is in the eyes, and you see all, have all kinds of color hallucinations, and the next one is in the ear, we have all kinds of music association, and that pretty much, that's it. But what Jin Sheng Tan does with these very strange, this is a kind of special, special effect in narrative. That is, do we understand this as kind of gore? Do we understand this as something that is the experience of the butcher? Is this something that the, someone, an onlooker, can we smell? Is it something that's so gruesome that we could smell it? Uh, or see this kind of explosion of colors, um, it's, it's not determined. And what Jin Sheng Tan is doing is, he's, is two things. He's, he's raising this kind of notion of paradox. Because ultimately, when we talk about sensation in a Buddhist sense, it's always something that's kind of, it's, it's kind of fictive. And what we're also doing at this moment in the narrative when Lu Zhishan is not yet, as he will soon be in a few chapters, he will be, in fact become shaven and, and he will become, he will be, begin his life as the, as the monk, Lu Zhishan. Um, and, in, and in fact, he ha does have a destiny. He has a kind of destiny to become a very realized 
Buddhist uh, enlightened figure, strangely enough. So that's just one example. There's, there's lots of, some very nice ones involving the Songjiang and Yenpo Xi um, episode from around chapter 20 that will also be um, featured in the performance Saturday. But unfortunately, I think it's, it'd be nicer to leave more time for questions than to, than to go into more detail on those. The one concluding thing I would say, though, is that when Jin Sheng Tan praises uh, Shen An, for this mastery, this ability to make every single one of this very complicated panorama of 108 different heroes, when he succeeds in doing this, what is the basis for his success in doing this? And what is, what is the faculty that is allowing uh, Shunayan to, to perform this wondrous feat of literary uh, skill such that all of these things are absolutely believable, absolutely alive? The answer is a very simple one. The answer is Go Wu. He says that Shi Dayan, this author, for 10 years he aligned things, he Go the Wu. He, he, he investigated things, he aligned the things, and then all of a sudden one day, Wu Go, the things aligned themselves. So he, the, he's, he's talking about the language he's using about Shi Dayan. Again, I'm not trying to argue that this is all Confucian or something, but the language that's being used about insight and writing and both in the terms of the reading and the interpretation of text and also in the crafting of, of literary works um, is one that is coming out of this very interesting context of both examination culture and commentary, fiction commentary, and again, the notion that one can find really uh, profound and uh, of kinds of insights of really cosmic importance everywhere in life, from popular song, from literature, but particularly from these previously perhaps undervalued, uh, what we now recognize as the classics of, uh, of vernacular fiction. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there with my presentation. I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, try to lead any kind of discussion or questions that any of you might have.